And your daughter Darcy, she Darcy's also an actor. has sung with you. I saw her clip Darcy's with... also a singer. Yeah. She's also doing her HSC this year, but um, <coughs> she was in Home and Away long before I was, a few years back. Um, her character was Ellie, I think, and then she was in The Dressmaker with me, although not with me, but she played the young Kate Winslet in Dressmaker. Oh. And um, most recently, Swing and Safari, the one with um, Guy Pearce and uh, Heidi Minogue. She was in that as well. And what was it like working with Kate Winslet? Did you oh, actually... she's beautiful. Yeah. She's such a good girl. I worked with her many, many years ago uh, in another Jane Campion film. And I thought, oh, she might remember me. How embarrassing when I walk into the makeup stand or I'll go up and say, oh, maybe you don't remember me, but I'm Jennifer, blah, blah, blah. And I walked into the makeup van and she said, Jan, how are you? She was so, you know, I just thought, even if somebody reminded her who I was, I thought it was really nice of her to, you know, treat me like an old mate. And that was good fun. She's a great girl. Just imagine what you would like her to be and that's what she's like. So shut your face, you stupid bitch. Shut your face, you stupid bitch. (laughs) That's what I'm about. Tell us about your book. Tell us about your your face, you stupid bitch. You know what? I've read Maxine's book. It is absolutely amazing. Fabulous. She talks about her Fantastic. career in all the shows you did. Yeah. So Hampton Court. Yeah. What else? Hampton shit. <laughs> That's what I called it in my book. Yeah. Neighbours. Yeah, no. You worked in Neighbours, yeah, you played neighbors. Stephen Dennis's yeah, shot him. wife, yeah. shot him dead. No, he didn't die. He's he didn't die, he oh, didn't of course. Die. Are you mental? Yeah, no, I don't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Neighbours too. I remember. Well, we've had enough of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so come on, tell us about the book. You've got it on, you've got a few copies oh. today, oh, haven't you? <laughs> and you've got t-shirts, and, and you've got mugs. And mugs. I'm on it. I'm on the merch. <laughs> Maxine's going to have a book over here, so just come and have a look at any time, and you can just kind of get a sense of what it's like. Lots of photos. You've got the most amazing pictures. In that book, there are plenty of photos, because I was young and I started, so I just kept everything. My logies, invitations, everything. So it's all in there, in the book. So have a look if you can. If you don't... Stop it. So, Maxine, you worked with Annie on Family and Friends yep. and Hampton Court. Yep. No, and she wasn't on Hampton Court. No, no, no. Shit. So, what else did, did you work with Annie on? Uh, oh, Colin Carpenter and, I don't know, something else. <laughs> A couple of things. Yeah. And Moonlight and Magic, you won an award for that? I did, right? yep. Yeah. That was with a Tim Spanos yeah. film? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you haven't done a lot in recent years, have you? Like no, I've been writing books. You've been writing books, and what a bloody great book it is. It's a good book. If you want to look at it, have a look. If you don't, stop it. And you did a Coles ad with Lisa McEwen. I mean, yeah. what more could you I've write for? Yeah, there plenty of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's about it, really. That's great. So yeah, if, anybody, if anybody wants to buy your book, or buy your cups, or yeah. buy your yeah, T-shirts, you get it's all over something. there. Yeah. The books have been sold. The books have been sold. We'll have, we'll have taking one, orders? I'm taking orders. One for display, but we're taking orders, and they'll be shipped out eventually. They can pay today, and we'll give them a receipt. Yeah. Um, Fifty dollars. Fifty for your book. bucks for a book. It's well worth it. Because then I can eat dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks, Maxine. You can sit down now. I've had enough too. Yeah, right. <laughs> Put your hands together for that. Please welcome the one and only Anne Phelan. started with, what have I got here? Well, you come from a musical family. Your mum and dad were both yeah, musical. Yeah, Saturday night round the piano. Your yeah. mum played piano, your dad played the squeeze box, she yeah. also played the spoons. Yeah, yeah. You, two of your brothers were both, singers. Both beautiful singers, And yeah. then you ended up doing a production of Kismet. Um, That's you were right. in the chorus for Kismet? Yes, it, it, it actually came about because of my brothers. Um, and that's why I have a show. My own show was called uh, an accidental actress, because I am an accidental actress. What happened was, I'd left school, I 
was playing, I played a lot of sport, believe it or not, and um, I was the captain of the badminton team. <laughs> and we used to rehearse in the church hall, uh, practice and play. St in Mary's the, Church Hall. In the St Mary's Church Hall. And I had a phone call, I was living with my mum and dad, and I had a phone call one night, oh this microphone! I had a phone call one night from uh, a gentleman who I didn't know, Kevin Doherty, I remember his name. And he asked to speak to me. And what had happened was, he said, now look, I run an amateur musical company. And um, we rehearse in the same hall that you play badminton in. And... We want the hall for an extra night, and the priest who ran the parish said, "Well, it's fine with me, but you better ring Anne Feelin and check that the that the uh, they're not playing." So he rang me, and I said, "No, no, we're not we're not playing that night. Go for it." And you know, pleasantries over with. I was about to hang up, and he said, "Feelin," and I said, "Yes." He said, "Are you any relation to Barry and Peter?" And I said, yes, they're my, my brothers. They're much older, I was a late baby. And uh, they, they were my, they're my brothers. And he said, if you're a feeling, you can see. He said, I went to school with your brothers. And he said, we need chorus members. And I didn't know what he meant by that. Because we weren't a theatrical family, we were just musical. So I finished up going up and joining the back row of the chorus of Kismet. And then one day you got a phone call saying, "Would you like to get paid for this?" Yeah. So you do you want to do a job and get? Do you want to do a job and get paid for it? So you ended oh, up in Adelaide. I did. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then from there you went to Melbourne. You worked with St Martin's for quite a while, yep. and then went on to do Bellbird. Yeah. Yeah. For about four, years, five, four years, in years in Bellbird. Anyone here old enough to remember Bellbird? Yes. No. Yes. Don't you? Yes. <laughs> Good. I only told the story about when someone in Belgrade went to the wheat silo and turned up to our two years later or something. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, Annie, the thing I love about you is you've done so, so much work for the community, the Victorian community, uh, Actors for Refugee, um, HIV and AIDS, um, uh, Victorian Positive Women. You were awarded an OAM for your uh, contribution to the Victorian Very community, yep. which is just amazing. And um, in recent years, you were given the Equity Lifetime Achievement Award. Yes. Yeah, Actors yes. Equity. Great. That deserves a round of applause. Yeah. Just amazing. You know what? The most amazing thing about Anne Feeling in recent years is that you found your daughter. She found me. She found you, <laughs> um, Sandy. Can you Sitting tell us right the story? Sandy, do you want to come over? Come over. Let, let's hear it to Sandy. Come I seat, was Sandy. 16 and promiscuous but naive. That's I where think I get that from. <laughs> so can you tell us your story? And uh, I had, a, I had a, a, a baby at 17 and as was the case in those days, it was quite normal and for my own good. To ha uh, you, you gave up your child for adoption, and that's the way it was done. And 50 years later, she found me. I did. It was interesting. I knew I was adopted, but then um, it wasn't until I don't know if people remember um, the then Julia Gillard as Prime Minister did the uh, national apology for the forced adoptions. Yep. And uh, it was actually that, that sort of the stories that came out of that sort of went, hang on a minute, I'm, I'm thinking about me, what about my mother? So that sort of got me doing the paperwork and everything else. And then um, through the research, I worked out that my mother was an ex-prisoner. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wrote a letter to Annie, um, and it was a letter that she didn't actually receive. So for the three years, I knew that she was my mother. Um, but I wasn't too sure whether she actually wanted contact or whatever, but uh, in the end, Anne actually didn't receive the letter. And uh, it was about three years later when I wrote uh, another letter, and she got that one, and two weeks before my 50th birthday, we met. Oh. Yeah. And uh, we're just, we just hit it off. It was great. And as you can see, we looked nothing alike. <laughs>
and uh, uh, Sandy's coming to work. I, I come from a very, like I've only got the two brothers, but they've got a million kids. <laughs> and I've got 18, 19 great nieces and nephews who are all adults now, and I've got great greats. And so Sandy has come from a relatively small family, quiet, Catholic, to this gigantic, drunken Irish lot. <laughs> And I'm having a ball. <laughs> she sort of knows where she fits. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sandy. Yay. Just before we finish up to this section, Annie, yep. um, what was it that you wanted to do in Prisoner that you never got the opportunity to do? I really wanted to dress up as somebody else and go to Myra's funeral. <laughs> I wanted to be an extra and I was going to get a curly wig. I, I talked it through with wardrobe and makeup and they were sort of, and I was going to be sort of quite subtle, totally, you know, a, a curly wig and everything. And the week of the funeral, I got another job. Aww. So I couldn't do it. And what were you wearing underneath the blanket when Myra oh, tragically died? Famous story. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was lying dead for two days, basically. Filming day. And um, I, uh, they, they put a blanket over me, so I had the check shirt on, but from the waist down, I had the very sexy uh, black mesh tights, <laughs> and the follow me home and fuck me shoes. <laughs> and, most importantly, a can of beer. <laughs> Thank you very much, Annie. We'll talk to you um, more later. Put your hands together for Annie. May I introduce probably the uh, early 1980s most feared character. She plotted, she planned, she schemed, she took many hostages along the way, and having said that, she loved her dog, greatly respected her father, and fought so hard to give young Shane the love and care that he so rightly deserved. The inmates nicknamed as a freak, and yet beneath that, beneath that tough exterior and often heartless demeanour of Joan Ferguson lay a much, much loved and respected actress, friend, mother and grandmother. Please put your hands together and warmly welcome Maggie Kirkpatrick. Sorry to leave you waiting so long out in the wings. All right, I woke up, don't worry. <laughs> oh, they're eating. Oh, good, that's nice. <laughs> so how have you been? What's been happening since Prisoner? Just getting old, that's all. <laughs> that's what you do. Now, come on, hurry up. They know more about me than I know myself. Right, now, hurry up. I'm, so was, I'm interested to know about the Susanna York... Um, oh, Christ. Oh, really, I know it's going back a long way, but you, you and Susanna York play Prisoners of War. Yeah, um, it was an Australian play that I'd done here for the 50th anniversary of yeah. the um, end of the Second World War. And I, I did it many, many times around Australia. And then when I was in England doing the Prisoner Musical on the West End, I managed to get it put on at the King's Head Theatre um, in London. And played, Susanna York played the English person that had been played here by Belinda Giblin and at one point Melissa Jaffa. Hmm. So that was that. Right. And when you did Home and Away, you were in it twice, and the yeah. second time you were in it, I died. You played an inmate. Is that right? You played like a. Um... Oh, I was supposed to have been an inmate, but it was just ridiculous, and I turned out to have been an old rude of um, the <laughs> Okay, so Maggie wants to eat. I suppose the actors want to eat. So thanks, Maggie Kirkpatrick. Thank you very much. And we'll hear more from you later. It's really lovely to see you, but we can talk later. Yeah. And as I said, you know more about me than I know myself. <laughs> Thank you, Maggie. On the show, talk about um, a, a certain program that he was watching on television and about a certain character that he found, and I quote, reminiscent of the real good old baddies of the black and white days of film. Little did he know that I based a heck of a lot of Joan Ferguson on a woman called Hope Emerson, um, who was a terrifying screw in a film with Eleanor Parker called Cage. Thank you. Um, anyway, when he got to Sydney, to Melbourne, 
the publicity department jumped on the bandwagon with him talking about the show during his show and uh, they said he, they brought him by helicopter out to the studio um, we had lunch in the boardroom and he and I jumped up and down like 12 year olds at uh, the joy of meeting each other and um, then we were invited to his show the next night and I gave him a condition on which I would... No, I've eaten it. We've eaten it. I gave him a condition under which I would come to, uh, to, to his show and he said, you give me a condition? I said, yeah, I want you to sing Funny Valentine. It wasn't in his repertoire at the time. And he did, he did sing it and consequently we became quite pally. Um, I went to see him in LA and in Vegas and um, he and Bill Cosby really took the piss out of me as a member of the audience being an Australian and contrary to what might have been happening with poor old Bill these days um, I can tell you that after I had uh, a, an after show drink with Sammy I sat in Bill Cosby's dressing room with he and his manager and had a great old yarn about Australia and about show business and um, you didn't lay a hand on me. <laughs> How beautiful. What a memory. Yeah. What, a, what a memory for everybody. Yeah. You know, I mean, all those other faces around there, and not just the cast. People like Eileen O'Shea and uh, Jennifer Kite was in there. Yeah. And the crew <coughs> and the director, whose name I can't remember, it's Sean somebody. Oh, the black hair, sure balding. No, no, we're trying to think of it. Yeah. I got very into trouble on Sean, what's his name? Sean, yeah. <laughs> you got into trouble, can you tell us about that? Oh, well, it was quite regular. <laughs> <laughs> A lot, and those ladies down the end were very patient. Sometimes they weren't so patient, but oh, Maxine no. and I were always in trouble. And um, one one Friday afternoon, um, he came on the set and cleared the set and said, not so fast, Genevieve. And uh, yeah, I was told if I didn't start behaving, he was going to have to talk to the producers about having me removed from the show. Oh. <laughs> oh, we just, we've wasted so much time because we made everybody laugh and just got into trouble all the time. And now, may I say, now that I'm this age, I'm such an old nanny and, and frown on anybody that wastes time, so I send a lot of love and sympathy up to the other end of the table because they put up with a lot of crap. <laughs> <laughs> right of reply from Anne and Maggie. Right <laughs> Sorry, I've got a mouthful of bun. <laughs> I just remembered... I'm going to have a confession, the two of us. Steve Mann's name came up. He was one of our favourite directors. And in those days, they don't do it now. The director is on the, the floor. But in prisoner days, the director was up in the control room. And if you actually heard a director, it meant, you know, you're in trouble. Um, because usually they would relay their messages through to the floor manager. But Maggie and I, while well, we were young and fit, we both, we both like a good time, and we hate a drink. And um, if we had a if we had a scene early in the morning, quite often Steve Mann's voice would come down. Could we have makeup to the floor, please? For eye drops for Maggie and Annie. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> Mike. Talking about naughty people. These young ones might think that they were naughty, but I can tell you that on Friday afternoons it was sheer hell between Elspeth Valentine, Sheila Florence, you name it. After lunch on a Friday afternoon. It was almost uncontrollable, the hysterics. And before I arrived, Elspeth and Fiona Spence, apparently, were constantly being sent off the set for <laughs> collapsing all over the place and never being able to get a line out. So it wasn't just the young folk who were naughty. Yes! 
There you go. Thanks, Maggie. The giggling, sorry, the you giggling. Know? You know that thing when you you always giggle either in church or at a funeral, yeah, yeah. and you can't stop. Yeah. And it was that sort of thing. And I had the same thing with, with Elspeth. We had to one of those long shots. She came round a corner, came down that way. I came round a corner and came towards her. There was hardly any dialogue, but. By the time we met, halfway down the corridor, we were just hissing ourselves with laughter. It got to a point, and it was getting late, and it was a Friday. That's why. And you just know that, you know, the crew can't go into overtime because it costs too much money. Um, so it got to a point where it was so bad that we only had to look at each other. We'd come round the corner, look at each other and burst into hysterical laughter. And finally, Uncle Rabies, as we knew him, Ray Lindsay, Uncle Rabies ordered us both to go and sit in the green room and pull ourselves together while they filmed the last film of the shot of the day and then we came back chastised. But it was dreadful. We, you, you would just get the giggle. But I do think... That sums up the show. Yeah, we yeah. we all had a ball, a yeah. and that was such a good thing, you know. And we just laughed and laughed and laughed. Yeah. I've been doing doing such occasionally heavy heavy scenes for some of us. I mean, there there was the comic relief down the end there. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you you talk about the the hours that you worked and the, the intensity of some of the scenes, the rapidity with which you had to work, and, and exhaustion. And then top it off with a couple of VBs on a late Friday afternoon, and um, all hell would break loose. And I tell you, Elspeth, Sheila Florence wet herself. That's how bad it used to get. She, she just laughed till she peed herself. I'm telling now. I never did, did you? <laughs> okay, just for something totally different, who remembers the Tic Tac ad in the 70s? Put a Tic Tac in your mouth and get a bang out of life. Let's just have a look at this little video and see if you remember anybody. The very beginning scene. Here we go. Put a Tic Tac in your mouth and get <laughs> There's Sandra, can't you see it? <laughs> hey, Dad, we were talking about Steve Mann before, one of the directors on Prisoner, and Steve has actually written something for today. Yeah, so Maxine is going to read what Steve has written. Look uh, at my $2 shop glasses, hang on. Nah, so all right. I'm um, all right. From Steve Mann, director. Hi, Rick. Here are some thoughts. Day one, shop one, take one, turn the bees in my ears, talk, talk to someone else. Yeah, shut her up. So I began my many years with the ladies of Wentworth. A bunch of women who producer Ian Bradley had brought together to torment us poor blokes at Channel 10. But what a joy to have the chance to work with some of Australia's best female actors, including all actors at the event with you right now. You mustn't know I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> this is an experience for all involved. No one had put together so many women in a green room for so many gruelling hours and what was to be the outcome. Well, a show that was to be the revolution of television in this country. So good, in fact, that they had to make a copy. <laughs> good on you, Stevie. All these women introduced me to the art of performance in a very special way, and in a way that has influenced my approach to actors ever since. And for that, I thank them, one and all. To Maggie. A big thank you for your friendship, and looking after me in so many ways, and your wonderful incarnation of the freak, never to be bettered. To Annie, again, thank you for your friendship and treasured trove of experiences, and for your introduction to the stage and those upon it, an invaluable gift to a fledgling director. To, to Genevieve, <laughs> who was an eternal spring of joy and laughter, and again for her understanding 
when things got tough. Oh, here comes Michael Fitt. To Maxine, who we all love, I oh, know, really, from day one. Thank you for working with me on some crazy ideas and making them work. And Jackie, like everyone from the cast, you're a pleasure to work with and a great addition to that cast. To all these women, I owe a great deal of gratitude and they enriched my life in many ways. There are so many stories to tell, but some are best left as memories. <laughs> At the time when we were all younger and TV was a big adventure, a time when we were all willing to risk it all, for that moment on, of a creative spark when it was all new and rather raw. To you all, thank you for being part of my journey. With regards, Steve. My bit was the best. <laughs> now, are there any more questions? Yes, I was just about to say some more questions. I would just like to know: Did you have a favourite storyline, a favourite storyline, or a particular actress that you enjoyed working with over the years in prison? Favourite storylines, I was blessed with a diverse range of storylines. You know, while we all remember Ferguson as being this die-hard, dreadful, awful creature, um, the softer moments meant a great deal to me because I think, you know, nobody's all that bad. I mean, somebody must have loved Hitler too. But uh, no, I, I was very happy with the way things went as far as um, Joan Ferguson's life was concerned and for me as an actor. Um, people working with, favourites to work with. I don't have any absolute non-favourites and that would be telling tales out of school but the scenes, the work of which I'm most proud is the work I did with Lehman, the work I did with Phelan, um, the latter work with um, the tall girl, Glenda. <laughs> Glenda. You know. No, I'm not saying who was the favourite top dog. No, because they scare me. No, I mean, you know, how lucky can an actor be to have the opportunity to just go for it with all those women and and to to trust each other as much as we did. Um, during the 80s with the Logie nominations, I was nominated umpteen times, but Rowena Wallace always got it. Because <coughs> she was glamorous. She was always on the cover of TV Week. <laughs> but they always showed scenes, the clips that I had done with Val. And I have to say, as an intro to that sort of violence, I'm eternally grateful to her for the work that we did on those scenes. And then each one was different, Anne was different again, but always a trusting and a, a, a joy to work with, with all of those, those women. I'm very lucky. I take my hat off to you all, you're amazing. I, I think the, the biggest um, positive about Prisoner, it was one of the rare shows of its time that used theatre-based actors. And I know there were some in it who weren't, had never been on stage, and it didn't make them a lesser actor. That's not <coughs> what I'm saying. But Maggie's point about trusting someone that you're working with, that sort of trust comes from theatre uh, a lot of the time. Um, it is a background, and that's... And also the fact that we weren't cast for our looks. <laughs> uh, no offence to anyone. But it was a show about real people. And even to this day, and that's why Wentworth works too, you know. Um, we mustn't forget the elephant in the room. Wentworth works beautifully. And again, there is every shape and size uh, person in the world in that show also and I can't believe that producers today say but why did it work 
and you'd go because A, it was as real as you can get for women. You know, we weren't these sort of, uh, you know, blonde bimbos. No, except for those lot down there. <laughs> <laughs> we can hear you. Yeah. So they, you know, I think that was the big thing too. That they were very real people, very real body shapes, and also our, most of us, um, theatre background has a, a huge bearing on it. Do you know any? That's how I learnt so much when I started on the show because I had barely any experience as an actor. Really, five weeks at yeah. the five weeks at the ABC <laughs> as, as a kid, and I I learnt so much. I, I was I, I realised after working on Prisoner and doing a lot of other shows how much I learnt from these ladies and people like Betty as well and just everybody who had a background and you absolutely make a great point because I went to other shows expecting the same kind of thing and it wasn't not a lot of them were and I did a lot and really people were not for the background that I was able to be offered and privileged to be offered I, I, I just I would have been I don't know do anyone watch Neighbours these days? Yep. <laughs> oh, shut up. Cheater. You're the cheat. You're the game cheat. But if you just look at the young kids. They're not getting the same sort of thing. I was very lucky. Very lucky. So lucky. I, th I think Maxine is right in that um, it can be a great training ground for, for people because it was for me. I had had 20 years in the theatre before Prisoner and I had done a spit and a cough here and there, you know, in one scene, out, in one episode, blah, blah, blah. Not a lot at all. And when I came into that show, I have to, aside from the trust that I've mentioned with the other women, the people who taught me about the craft of camera work was the crew. The most wonderful, wonderful crew that you could ever wish to work with. Um, they were young, they were, they were hungry, they were good, they were experimenting. We were all new at what we were doing on such a level. And, um, and it was a great marriage and I, I thank them to this day. And people like Jenny Williams who, um, what did she do? She cut it. She, she switched it. It was called switching in those days. But it was virtually editing on the spot because she would choose the moment in a scene and tell the director what was going to work and what wasn't type thing. She taught me to know exactly on what point of a line or a turn of an eye, a, a, these little nuances. And that just all came from a cameraman putting his hand around from the camera and just going, or just doing that, or, you know, little, little signals here and there. So I, for one, 35 years down the track and still eternally grateful. I rarely get in front of a camera these days, but when I do, I'm home. Yeah. I know it. Yeah. Yeah. And I still, I speak to Jen Jen Williams all the time. I speak to Jen all the time. We're really good friends still to this day. And she was amazing because she, when she was, as Maggie was saying, switching, even though the director might have blocked it for like, oh, cut to that shot for that line, she'd wait till the actor had a tear running down and then, or something, or a punch, or whatever we were doing, and then she'd cut it then, and, and she made that call, and everyone trusted her with that. Mm. And they respected her for totally, it. Totally, oh, totally. Right. Yeah. And to this day. She and Julie um, Bates. Julie Bates, yep. Yeah. She's a grandmother now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so guys, I think it's about time for our prisoner quiz. Ah, okay? Oh. We're going to spice things up a bit. Maybe well, we should quiz one. you. <laughs> <laughs> now the actors have agreed to move over to each individual table. So we're going to have Team Joan, Team Susie, Team oh, well, Bobby, oh. Team Myra, and wherever Marlene Rabbit Warren is. Oh, um, Taking care of a phone call, she's Oh, uh, no worries. And also Team Daryl. <coughs> so as the actors make their way over to... Where am I going? Just pick a table, maybe. Any table. Okay. okay. 
<laughs> so if we can just organize a chair for Maggie and Annie and each of the actors come to the tables. Uh, Eric and David used to say it all the time. Uh, so that's Robert, the darling boy. What a handsome man. That could be to the side now. Oh, you give me my love. I, what a beautiful I just had um, <laughs> Ian asked about the table. You're name. at the freak table. Very well, it was made by. Who made that? Who made that? Who said very well then? Very well then? Awesome. Erica Davison. <laughs> the freak, well, we knew the freak. You've got two left hands, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a second pair. Jeez, fuzzy. Till I have to face a nightmare of waking up alone on the inside of the roses grow. They don't find the stony ground, but the roses here are prisoners too. <laughs> 